Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Hello, hello, how are you? Thank you. I'm very well, how are you? With the technology. <laughs> I know, we connected, that's great. I'm just going to turn you up a little bit. Fabulous. There we go. Brilliant. So I think we've got some people joining us. So I'll just start with a hello and welcome to the South Downs National Park Dark Skies Festival, which is on Instagram Live. Um, so this year we're focusing very much on the personal and cultural relationships with the dark skies because obviously we can't get out there and deliver the usual kind of events program that we'd like to um i'm the cultural heritage lead for the national park and i'm joined by the new york times best-selling author joe marchant it's lovely to have you here um, you. we'll be talking to joe about her latest book which i'm going to hold up for you there it's got a great cover so the human cosmos and this explores our relationship with the stars from the paleolithic right the way through to the present day and i think um given we're both new to this technology i'm both pleased and extremely grateful and <laughs> relieved to be welcoming you here today um we've got a first question to kick off with and i think you're going to read some extracts from our book which will give people a real flavor for it so i'll just start with our first question which is what did you set out to do with this book yeah hi thanks so much for having me so yeah the book is about our changing relationship with the sky with with the heavens and the reason that i wanted to write it was really to do with growing levels of light pollution because every society through history has looked up and been inspired by the heavens until now um, surveys of light pollution show that 80 percent of us in europe and the us can't see the milky way our own galaxy at all um, instead of thousands of stars that you'd normally see in a dark sky in today's cities we can see just a few dozen even on a clear night so I wanted to know what we're losing. Um, this is something that's been so important through human history. What is, what is that meant to us? And what is that, you know, is that important now that we're becoming less and less able to see the stars? So I really look at that sort of from the beginning, from the Paleolithic, as you mentioned, um, and looking at how our view of the stars is really something that's made us who we are. It's shaped our politics, our religion, our arts, even our own biology. Um, and so that's a sort of huge loss of cultural heritage if we can't see those stars anymore. But also, just in the last few years, scientists have been studying the emotion of awe, the way we feel when we see the stars. And they've been finding that that's actually really important. It creates some quite sort of profound changes in us. It makes people more creative, more curious, happier, less stressed, but also uh, more, more generous. They make more ethical decisions. People care less about money and more about the planet. So I really think that this view of the heavens is something that connects us to a bigger picture and it's something that's really important still today uh, as well as through history. Um, so yeah, I was gonna do uh, two really short little readings. Um, they're two uh, different views of the stars. Uh, so, first one. When NASA astronaut Chris Hadfield climbed out of the International Space Station for his first spacewalk in April 2001, it was the culmination of decades of training and preparation. A hard-headed, disciplined pilot, Hadfield had studied maths, physics, engineering and robotics. He had flown over 70 different types of aircraft. He had spent 50 full days practicing spacewalks in the pool. I was completely technically prepared for what was going to happen, he says. And yet, in a sense, he wasn't prepared at all. When he first floated free in the vacuum of space, holding on to the spaceship with one hand, all thoughts of his mission temporarily left his head. Instead, he was attacked by raw beauty. To his right was the velvet bottomless bucket of the universe, stretching on forever and brimming with stars. And to his left, the whole world, an exploding kaleidoscope of colour, poured by. It was stupefying, he said later. It stops your thought. Alone in his spacesuit, looking down on six billion people and all of the history, all of the beauty and poetry and everything that is human, Hadfield says he learned something in that moment that a lifetime of books, lectures and calculations had been unable to teach. The power of the presence of the world, as told to me my butt as told to me by my ability to see it. And I think that's really beautiful about the importance of it being him up there in space, able to see the world and not, not just machines. Um, and then 
And the second little passage is just about how when we're on earth looking up at the skies, um, that view can be just as profound and just as spellbinding. A few summers ago on a feature assignment, I found myself in a tiny one person tent, sheltering from a violent thunderstorm in the remote mountains of Mexico. When the rain finally stopped, I squeezed out into the night. I felt anxious and alone until I looked up and was hit by a rush of adrenaline. Above me was a radiant, shimmering sea, an ocean of light that stretched not just from horizon to horizon, but deep into forever. For a brief moment, I was lifted up, connected, home. Thinking back, it isn't the individual constellations I remember, or the planets, or even the glittering ribbon of the Milky Way. It is simply the sheer awesome power of the sky. In London, where I live, the night sky is dull and dark with a neon orange glow, its emptiness broken by only a few struggling pinpricks of light. But here, the veil was lifted, as if returning to me something that I hadn't even known was lost. On this moonless night, it seemed there was no blackness at all. There was only silver, only stars. So that was just trying to give a sense of this view that I'm talking about that is just becoming rarer and rarer these days, but it's been such a powerful force in, in human history. And that's really what I'm trying to look at in the book. I think what's lovely about those two extracts is one is about that sort of privileged, privileged position of an astronaut looking down, but also that position that we can all take which is a person climbing out of a tent or walking out of the house and looking up which was your experience which I think is just that really great contrast in terms of the sky being accessible to all of us you know the cosmos being accessible to all of us so we've got um we've got our next question here which is your book charts the evolution of our understanding and our beliefs um of the night sky and how as our scientific understandings increased, our spiritual connection has seemed to diminish. And I, I really loved where you talked about um, in Babylonia, where um, astrology and astronomy sort of came together as one discipline. But nowadays, they're distinctly separate. Um, do you feel this separations played a role in our in our changing relationship with the night sky over time and, and certainly today? Yeah, absolutely. That separation, it I wasn't necessarily planning it at the beginning, but it really became a, a central theme of, of the book, this fact that we understand so much about the cosmos now from a scientific point of view, and yet we're so separated from it uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We've got all this modern technology, um, clocks, GPS, central heating. You know, we don't really need to look to the sky for anything anymore so it's and with light pollution as well it's getting harder and harder to have that sort of personal direct connection with the stars so the story absolutely became about that gradual loss of that relationship with the stars which uh, you know even as we've built a better understanding of them from an intellectual point of view so yeah I start that right back in the paleolithic um, looking at um, cave paintings and trying to sort of put together clues about what kind of cosmos would people have have had in those times um, I'm just going to try and show I don't know if it's going to work <laughs> this picture so this amazing I don't know if, that is a, a cave painting from Lascaux cave in France it's about 20,000 years old and you can see it's a bull it's you know there's parts of it missing but that's the head of a bull with the horns pointing forward and these six dots um, above its shoulder and you see similar patterns of six dots in art all through um, history and around the planet and they are usually showing the star cluster the Pleiades and actually if you look at this is the con modern constellation Taurus um, with the Pleiades at the shoulder and so if you look at them together it's just a really striking similarity so I start off by kind of looking at this and saying, you know, could they really have been painting star maps in Paleolithic times? And there is quite a lot of evidence from the caves themselves, but also looking from um, hunter-gatherer communities, sort of more recent communities, that that is sort of possible and, and I think quite plausible, actually. When you look at these kinds of um, hunter-gatherer communities more recently, um, this cosmos is so central in their lives. It, it's telling, you know, it's telling them kind of where they are, giving them a sense of orientation. It's telling, giving them a sense of time, giving a sense of sort of who they are and where they fit. And different constellations of stars will sort of 
become visible and disappear again at different times of year. And that scene is very bound up with seasonal changes, natural changes on Earth. Um, so the um, Native American Blackfoot people, for example, traditionally relate the visibility of the Pleiades stars in the sky with the life cycle of the bison, which they hunt, and that's part of their calendar. And so it's possible that right back in the Paleolithic, they were doing something similar with the oryx bull in the Pleiades. So it's an absolute kind of, there's no distinction made between earth and sky, people and nature. It's this very holistic view. And then you mentioned the Babylonians, so kind of jumping forwards then to the first civilizations, the first writing. Now we've got clay tablets and we can see what people were thinking about the skies. And the Babylonians were obsessed with celestial motions. They saw, so, you know, in the Paleolithic, different stars are being related to different, you know, animals on, on Earth. And that, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Those, those correlations really existed. But the Babylonians saw pretty much everything, um, change in direction of a planet, a lunar eclipse, as this was all omens foretelling terrible things that were going to happen on Earth. And the king had priests, teams of priests, priest astronomers, really, or astrologers, whichever you want to call it, who would be watching the sky every night reporting back on what they were seeing, what the omens were saying, what rituals the king was going to have to do to stay alive and stay in power. And that was, that's interesting because that's kind of the roots of astrology. But it also, because they were watching the sky every night meticulously, n keeping detailed records, they started to recognise repeating patterns mm. in what patterns of eclipses, for example, um, repeat roughly every 18 years. And so they started to use sort of mathematical models to describe those repeating patterns and so their belief in omens then sort of drove them to make these detailed observations and become the first to use mathematics numbers to make sense of the sky and that is also the sort of the groundwork really for our modern scientific astronomical view so it really all both of those kind of schools of thought started um, started with the Babylonians. So that, that was a, a very sort of important moment in human history, I think, that really changed our relationship with the stars. I think there was something that really sort of struck me in the book when you were talking about the potential for these cave paintings to somehow being unifying concepts of the cosmos in with nature. I thought that was really powerful. So this idea of somebody painting on a cave wall, uh, an animal that you know, is, was very much part of their life cycle, their life experience, their experience of nature. But to bring the cosmos within that, I thought was really powerful, actually, is something to explore. And I think you touched on this in your book, that idea that sort of with the ad advent of farming very slowly, there's this change in dynamic that's apparent between um, the human relationship with nature, but the human relationship with the cosmos as well, which was just really powerful and really interesting to explore in the context of your study of the cosmos. Yeah, well, at the beginning, the sort of appearances of different stars was really important for agriculture. The ancient Greeks had star calendars that would tell you which constellations were um, becoming visible at different times of year, and that was linked to the agricultural calendar. But of course, with the advent of farming there was a really big change in our relationship with nature generally um sort of people are setting themselves apart from nature and you see a change in beliefs about the cosmos as well in the paleolithic you have these great animals in the sky and then in the neolithic after the advent of farming or around that time you see much more of a focus on humans sort of being um represented and um human ancestors in, in particular and so there's definitely a really interesting kind of shift there away from nature that's also reflected in in cosmology and then of course more recently you know with our developments of technology that and a scientific way of thinking you know we have this mathematical kind of objective way of um sort of investigating and understanding the, the cosmos and so we rely on that the evidence the data the the measurements and that's been very very you know, powerful mm. and important, but at the same time, that human sort of personal direct experience and those connections that we're making between what's happening on Earth and in sky, that's kind of been sidelined and kind of drain, drained away. And, and I do think that's a really interesting kind of transformation that's happened. And you touched there on that sort of personal understanding of the sky and then that objective mathematical relationship with the sky. And, and the ancient Greeks did play a role in that, didn't they, as well? Yeah, so they inherited a lot of 
their knowledge from the Babylonians, so astrological beliefs, but, and also a lot of the Babylonians' astronomy, and then they then built on that. The Babylonians had a very arithmetical view of the sky, like computing the changing positions of, of planets, almost as if it was on a flat screen. And the Greeks had a much more kind of 3D geometrical view of the, the you know the spherical orbits of the heavens and it was really when those two traditions came together that was very powerful and then sort of astronomy really took off um, and I just wanted to mention talking about the Greeks there there's this fabulous um, an invention that dates from around the first century BC that was what got me interested in the history of astronomy in the first place this just blew me away when I first heard about it. It's called the Antikythera mechanism. So some of the audience may have um, heard about this already, but if you haven't, it's really an amazing thing. My first book was actually about the Antikythera mechanism and it was found on a shipwreck. It's a, this bronze device found, found in pieces on this 2000 year old shipwreck. Um, and when it was, it was brought up by sponge divers at the beginning of the 20th century and it, it sort of broke apart and it was apparent that inside this were these lots and lots of very complicated gear wheels, pointers, measuring scales, inscriptions. And it was essentially a mechanical calculator or computer for, um, and it took scientists a century essentially to kind of work out what on earth this thing was, to reconstruct it, but it was for modeling the cosmos. It was like a little pocket universe, if you like. Um, I'm just gonna, again, I don't know how well this will work. But these are some pictures of this, that, that, that there is the sort of largest surviving piece. You can see a big gear wheel and there are others sort of tucked in behind it. Um, there's a couple of the other pieces. So it, this is held in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. And here is a picture. This is a guy called Michael Wright who made a, a sort of reconstruction of it. You can see like a wooden box with a bronze big dial on the front and essentially if you imagine a kind of a clock with a wooden case and all the complicated gear wheels inside and then a big dial on the front with pointers and those pointers instead of telling the time um, they're showing the movements of the sun and the moon and the planets through the sky it's it's turned with a handle on the side but not just they're not just going at constant speed this thing is modeling the very the very subtly varying speed of the sun and the moon and also the backwards and forwards motion of the planets as you're turning it so they're all turning at their own speeds there's a little black and white ball that rotates to show the phase of the moon there's a star calendar engraved on the front on the back you've got another calendar there's two spiral dials one is a calendar also shows you the timing of different um, athletics games, including the Olympics, which is interesting. Um, and then on the bottom, there's an eclipse prediction dial. So it's almost like a, an iPad or something. It's got all these different kind of apps and, and functions and really sophisticated um, gear work inside. And when it was found, I mean, it was, it was just, we know of nothing else as sophisticated as this for well over a thousand years afterwards. So it really changed ideas about what the Greeks were capable of. And it, it shows that they too were really obsessed with the heavens, the height of their technology. And it was a miniature universe. And we might think, well, they had clockwork. Why didn't they make actual clocks? Or why, why didn't this trigger an industrial revolution? Why weren't they doing useful work with this technology? But they weren't. They were using it to, to model and, and connect with the, the cosmos. And again, that just shows you how important that the sky, you know, the night sky has been to people all the way through history. So I think there'll be a lot of people going away and Googling a bit more about that. Yeah. <laughs> Antikythera, A-N-T-I-K-I-T-H-E-R-A, -E if you want to go. <laughs> I think just the concept of this first century BC proto-computer is just phenomenal. Um, and sort of talking about scientific advances, you, you do describe a number of scientific advances in your book, which gives us a great feeling about the background against which these discoveries were made, but also that real tenacity and those dogged characters that were making these breakthroughs. Can you give us two examples of your particular favourites from your book? Yeah, so I, I try to sort of frame the book around stories. So every chapter tells a different story, essentially. Um, and so trying to get a sense of the the period in history and then the time um, and the people um, and then yeah so each chapter is um, there's a chapter about um, art for example a chapter about politics a chapter about time how we invented our sense of time um, and so yeah there's lots of different ones I could choose but um, one of my favorites it's actually a, a couple a husband and wife called William and Mary Huggins um, and they were amateur astronomers in the 19th century in Victorian times 
And one of the reasons I like them so much is because it turns out that they live just around the corner from me in South London. Um, they lived in Tulse Hill and in their garden, they had built this observatory with this huge telescope um, that William Huggins initially was using it to observe the, the stars and he was drawing the planets. But then he went to a lecture about this new technique called spectroscopy, um, which essentially splits the light, um, splits light into a spectrum and so that you can look very precisely at the different frequencies of light that are present. Um, and it was invented originally to look at the different color flames. When you burn an element in a flame, different elements have different color flames. Um, and um, Robert Bunsen in Germany, who invented the Bunsen burner, and his, his colleague Gustav Kirchhoff, a physicist, they had invented this method where they would use, they would take the colored flame the light would go through a telescope, use a prism to split the light, and then you can look at the presence and absence of different colour frequencies. So rather than just going, well, that flame's greenish blue, and that flame's blue, and that one's pink, you can, you can measure the different frequencies very precisely. Um, and they used it to look at the, um, the light coming from the sun, and they, they showed that, that I'm not telling this very well. So first of all, they show that every different chemical element has its own very specific pattern of light, like a fingerprint. Then they looked at sunlight, um, which shows and, and showed that the same elements that are present on Earth are also present in the sun, which was completely revolutionary at the time. You know, these were just celestial bodies, these mysterious glowing lights in the sky. And so the discovery that they had the same chemical elements, the same chemistry as on Earth was was really mind blowing at the time. And William Huggins then took that and started looking at different stars. And then he started working with his wife. Um, and I, 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 I kind of love it because he was very um, uh, sort of um, determined, kind of focused scientist. Um, look, and then his wife was much more um, artistic um, and had a sort of bigger picture view. Um, and sh she had this lovely quote about how it sort of takes faith to be as as happy and squinting at these little patches of light and dark as in feasting and the beauties of the heavens. And I kind of empathise with her on that. But they, they spent decades then looking at the patterns of light from different stars, from nebulae. Um, and really, they were pioneers of the field of um, astrophysics, where for the first time, it became possible to actually understand the chemical composition of celestial bodies, work out what they're made of, how they actually work. And so this is, was really revolutionary. So you've gone from just being able to watch the motion of a celestial body and describe its um, behavior and its appearance to actually what are these things up there in the sky? And, and astrophysics has been so influential ever since then. And I love the fact that all of this was happening in this back garden in Tulsa. <laughs> around the corner from me. Um, and then the, the other one I would choose is a guy called Frank Brown, who was a biologist um, in, uh, well, starting to work in the 1950s and 60s. And he was... He did this quite a famous experiment with oysters. So he was interested in um, biological rhythms or, or clocks, um, which at the time was quite a controversial topic. So he was convinced that animals could somehow keep time. And he took oysters from the, he was working in the US, he took oysters from the East Coast, from the ocean, and he knew that they feed at high tide, um, which is obviously time with the moon. And then he brought them to his lab in Illinois, so far, far inland. Um, and put them in a sort of enclosed dark room in tanks of water, sort of completely shielded from any tides or changes in light or temperature, because he wanted to see if they could still follow that tidal rhythm, would they keep time? Um, and they, they did keep time, but what happened over a couple of weeks is they actually shifted their rhythm by about three hours, I think it was. So it kind of shifted and then settled on a new time. And he realized that what they'd done is they'd actually, this new time was in perfect time with the moon in Illinois, like if there had been a tide in Illinois, they would have been feeding at high tide for Illinois. So he became convinced that organisms can somehow, there's these mysterious cosmic cues that can, organisms can somehow sense the, the moon and the sun and that's helping them to keep time. And he was ridiculed um, in his own lifetime. Most of the rest of the field dismissed his work um, and the rest of the field became very focused on circadian rhythms, the sunlight, the daily rhythms and how that affects our biology. And we now know that that's that sort of built into our genes. You know, this daily rhythm is so important for every aspect of life. But he was convinced that the moon was also important and that also 
magnetic fields were important. And actually, just in the last few years, biologists are realizing that he was right about a lot of that. We now know that lunar clocks are also encoded in the DNA, certainly of a lot of marine species. Um, hundreds of genes in things like coral, fish, uh, marine worms are varying with the phase of the moon. Um, and biologists think that it, that may well, we don't know yet, it, but that may be true for people as well. And there's more work looking at sort of menstrual cycles as well. This has been a very controversial topic, but now there are studies hinting that perhaps moonlight can entrain women's menstrual cycles. And a really interesting study a couple of years ago um, that showed that in patients with bipolar disorder, their mood swings are triggered by changes in sleep patterns. But when patients track the timing of that over many years, it was shown that that actually was being driven by tidal cycles of the moon. Um, so whether that's gravitational effects or magnetic effects, no one's quite sure, but it's, it's just showing that there is so much that we don't yet understand. We're much more plugged into sort of cosmic cycles um, than, than we've realized. And so that's a really interesting area of, of biology at the moment. And it's vindicating a lot of what Frank Brown originally said. And I think it's really interesting that you, you say there's so much that we don't know, because when I read your book, what struck me is that Brown's, um, Brown's understanding was based on, on, on forces that weren't fully understood at the time, but were, um, really really strongly suggested by that observational behavior pattern that, that he saw and it, and it did one of my takeaways when I read that chapter was you know are we more or less accepting of that concept of mystery and the unknown now than perhaps he faced at the time when he he was studying and that sort of leads on quite well I think to the next question that we've got which is um, the NASA Mars mission is due to touch down on the 18th of February and that's looking for signs of past um, microbial life and you talk about Mars in your book and particularly um, the endeavours to try and identify the potential for life on the planet and to understand if our planet is the only one capable of bearing life in the galaxy do you think our changing understanding of Mars and that sort of concept of we are not alone in terms of the cosmos has changed our relationship with it? So, yeah, I think it absolutely has. So people all through history have, have been really interested, fascinated by this question of are we alone in the universe? Even back in you know ancient Greek times, there were people sort of speculating about there being infinite worlds out there. And if so, there had to be life on some of them. Um, people were writing science fiction stories about life on the sun or the moon. So th this has always been something people have been interested in. Um, but the kind of idea of alien life was sort of shut down by the Christian church, for certainly in the Western world, through a lot of our, our history. And it's kind of ebbed and flowed ideas about it since then. And it's one of those questions that what, whatever the answer, it's just mind blowing. Like either we are the only life in this entire vast cosmos <laughs> <Yeah>. or <laughs> we're not. So... Either way, it's just, you know, incredible to, to think about and changes. I think it gives us a way to think about being human and, or, you know, what, for, what is life? You know, what does life mean? And that's really informed by searches for life elsewhere. Because if you're starting to look for life elsewhere, you have to think about what are you looking for? How would you know it when you saw it? Um, and also, what does it mean to be human as well? If you're thinking, could there be conscious life? Um, elsewhere and I think it's really interesting how it, through the most of the 20th century the pendulum has swung to quite a negative place aliens UFOs were seen as quite a fringe belief um, and then a few things happened one was the discovery of the first um, exoplanet so the first planet orbiting a star not in our solar system um, in the 1990s and, and now we've discovered thousands of exoplanets and it's it's weird to think that it's actually so recently that we had never seen one um and i think that really changes the odds for life you know it, it, it seems quite likely that there are more planets out there in our in our galaxy than stars sort of hundreds of, of, of billions so you think well surely there's got to be life on some of those there's also um biologists are realizing even on earth that life inhabits so many more environments and niches than we realize like anywhere you think of looking i think there was a, a story just the other day where they drilled down through hundreds of meters of ice shelf and, and and found sponges and all sorts of things like perfectly happy down there so pretty much anywhere we look if there's liquid water 
there is life so that kind of expands your possibilities you know we we were very anthropocentric anthropocentric about it for a long time but you know life is perfectly happy in lots of environments that we would think were not habitable um even in space you know we see tardigrades and there's been experiments with with organisms surviving there um but then also in that chapter i look at um the i don't know if people remember the asteroid alh84001 which came from mars which had these tiny sort of they look like little fossils of bacteria back in the 1990s that created a big storm and was announced by bill Clinton and the White House Rose Garden as being possible life. And there's been a big argument, scientists have been arguing about, was that really life? Are they Martian fossils ever since? And that question has never been resolved. That's never been disproved. Um, but it, what that work did, even though it didn't prove that there are aliens, is it really opened people's minds to the possibility and got scientists thinking about well, what do we need to look for? How are we going to answer these questions? And really shifted NASA's course from kind of big we're going to land on the moon to you know we're, we're going to have missions and we're going to look for life and we're going to try and understand the universe as a possible habitat for life and that's what you know the mars rover that's landing on thursday i think it is it is a part of that so now attitudes have completely changed i think most scientists will be very open to the possibility of, of alien life and we're going to have to get used to the idea of ourselves as part of this yeah this bigger cosmic web of biology i guess I think what's, what, what made me chuckle was seeing a, a news headline that said we found life where there shouldn't have been any or something about that recent case of drilling. Yeah, by and it's so anthropocentric that we yeah. you know, <laughs> can't get down there. But, but life just, yeah. I think um, it's really fascinating. When you talk about that sort of bigger web of life, I think all of us now, from a personal perspective, have experienced our lives really contracting because of the pandemic. So, you know, our centre of gravity feels much smaller as individuals. Um, and I think the thing we're all recognising is that um, we've all become more reliant on screens generally and um, computers, smartphones, that type of technology. And I think that's particularly increased during COVID. Um, you talk a lot in the book, actually, about that rhythms and function in terms of the body, the connection with time, with light. Um, there's also growing evidence about that lack of daylight having an impact on health. But what role do you think that dark skies has on our mental and our physical health? Yeah, so I'm really interested in this. Yeah, this disconnection, as we talked about at the beginning and does that matter why is that important for us and as you say we've got this modern technology it's perfectly possible to live without ever really seeing the the sky having any sense barely of if it's day or, or night let alone what's happening with the stars and you know we've got incredible uh, convenience ease freedom you know these technologies are great but scientists are starting to realize that there are some downsides to that so you know people used to navigate by the stars now we have gps um and neuroscientists are realizing that actually if you rely too much on GPS to navigate, that actually rewires our brains and makes people less able to pay attention to details in their environment and to navigate for themselves. The relevant parts of the brain actually start to shrink over time. Um, so it's kind of use it or lose it, really. Um, with biological clocks that we talked about, that there's lots of evidence now that there are health problems that are occurring if we're not sufficiently sort of tuned in to that those light dark cycles certainly of the sun possibly of the moon as well um clocks as well i mean the time used to be just embedded in the movements of the, of, of the cosmos and now we have very accurate clocks we're all rushing to meet deadlines and there's this phenomenon in psychology now called time famine where people just feel constantly rushed like they never have enough time in the day i don't know if anyone <laughs> finds that familiar um and that is has consequences because time famine people cite that as a reason why they don't do really important things like eat healthily or go to the doctor when they need to exercise um help other people um so again if we're if we're counting seconds all the time and not taking in that bigger picture that that can also be harmful and then specifically with dark skies and stargazing i think the most interesting research there is what i mentioned at the beginning about this emotion of awe like how do we feel when we see the stars um, and what is that doing to us um and often when scientists want to study awe they show people the stars i mean it's the it's the most they so the definition of awe, the sort of scientific definition if you like is when you're confronted with something vast so huge that it dwarfs you that it sort of beyond your capacity to comprehend it uh, often there's an edge of of fear almost with with awe as well and there's a sort of dark side to it you might be sort of 
almost overtaken or subsumed by this this vastness um and yeah there's nothing more vast than than the cosmos and although it has this edge of fear to it scientists are finding that it, it does make people more creative more curious happier less stressed even weeks later after experiencing awe and that lower stress they can see in markers in the blood as well that's a sort of physiological effect but what i think is really interesting is it's not just a kind of personal mental well-being thing it actually changes people's perspective so people become more generous they make more ethical decisions they're more likely to make sacrifices to help other people they care less about money and more about the planet so it's really people feel more connected as well to a bigger picture i think that's the, the key thing so Another interesting finding is that people, after feeling awe, they estimate their own physical size as smaller. They sign their name as smaller. Brain scans show that brain activity associated with our sense of self is reduced. So it seems that awe is kind of shifting our focus away from ourselves. So that kind of, you know, when you're engrossed in your own daily selfish concerns and everything seems so important, all pulls you out of that, and makes you see yourself as connected to a bigger picture. And that changes how people live. It changes the kinds of decisions that they make. So this is really kind of profound, you know, important effects that the starry sky can give us that, you know, we're now starting to lose. It's just inspiring hear you, hearing you talk about that. And I think we shared previously that is, uh, my father had shared with me a long time ago that when a relative of his had passed away, his mother, to help him cope with the loss of somebody in his family, said, well, if you look up, the first star you see every night is your Uncle Arthur. And I think it's also, it is that that sense of comfort that we get in being reminded that we're part of something bigger. And for, for my father as a small boy, that was massively resonant. And that that's sort of something that's carried with me, that, that sense of awe. And I think, you know, as you know, we're really lucky here in the South Downs National Park because we have that visibility of the stars, of the night sky. We're designated as an international dark sky reserve. Um, how important do you think it is that people have access to places like this, particularly sort of within reach of urbanised areas? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important as we are losing that view. As I said at the beginning, 80 percent of people in Europe and the US can no longer see the Milky Way, this incredibly important part of our cultural heritage. And, and now we're realising the sort of psychological benefits of that as well. Um, some of the researchers on awe have warned about what they call awe deprivation. So this idea that in modern life, we're all kind of focused on our small screens. You know, we're not connecting with the, the vast horizons of nature. We're not getting that sense of a bigger picture. Um, and they warn that that's something that they think is making society more selfish, more narcissistic. I mean, this goes for nature generally, not only the sky, but I do see the stars as a sort of quintessential source of awe, but also, you know, just getting, getting out into nature. Um, but I think it's really important that we we fight to protect the dark sky wherever we can and particularly in places where that's going to be uh accessible um for, for as many people as possible to, to come to um but i would also say that you know especially at the moment when we can't travel there are things that we can do to connect with the sky you know even if we're stuck in an urban area and there's a lot of light pollution um for a long time, I didn't really get into stargazing where I live in London because I just thought that there isn't really any point. But I have realised that that actually there are all sorts of things that you can connect to. Um, the, just looking at the planets and the brighter stars. So now I kind of follow the the, the planets with the children. Often, if we're walking home, we'll, we'll you know Venus will guide us home, for example. Um, this the star Sirius. You know, it has that beautiful kind of rainbow flickering light that you can you know we can see that even from our home here and i watch that with the kids you can follow the changing phases of the moon and what i also love is learning the stories about the heavens what different people have believed about these celestial bodies and about the stars um through history so which were the stars that the um the polynesians were using to navigate across the pacific for example or we talked about the people of lasco linking the pleiades to an oryx bull um so just these these stories i think they really you're talking about that sort of sense of meaning in the sky and i think that that helps to make the sky 
a place that we can explore and, and find meaning and a kind of neighbor, a neighborhood, especially at the moment when we can't travel very far beyond our neighborhood. We can explore the sky and find those stories and, and have that sort of sense of, of belonging and connection, even if we're somewhere where um, the skies aren't quite as dark as we would like. <laughs> um. I, well, I mean, as you've touched on, dark sky is hugely inspirational. And I think that idea that we could be thousands of miles apart, but we can look up and see the same thing, regardless of who we are, where we come from. What role do you think that dark skies has in making us more collaborative? And I, I think here, particularly in terms of the big global questions that we're currently facing. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I do see the stars as something that really connects us so it's connecting us not just to the cosmos but to to each other to humanity through history and all around the world there's you know it's a cliche but it's true that we're all looking up at the same stars and we know from the, the research that i just talked about that that makes people feel more collaborative feel more connected care more about those kind of bigger problems and you know we've got so many global challenges to face at the moment um you know with the the pandemic with climate change um, and I think we we need the scientific understanding um, so we've, we've built this sort of intellectual understanding and we've got the sort of scientific approach for understanding um, our environment and the cosmos and we need that that's really important for understanding challenges we face for coming up with solutions um, but I think if we're going to have the motivation to solve these problems to make the decisions that we need to make to live sustainably and peacefully on this planet then we're also going to need to put that aside sometimes and and just to have that that awe that that personal experience of the sky and i think that sort of leads on to our our sort of closing questions which is for anyone who reads this book or or uh, you know after hearing this discussion is going to rush off and buy this book which i hope they are going to um what do you hope what hope do you have for our changing relationship with darkness, space, the cosmos? Yeah, well, it was really apparent to me, looking back over this sort of long history of our relationship with the sky. So I don't think I really realised until I did that, until I stepped back and looked at that sort of long sweep and at what the stars have meant to people through history and how important that they've been and how as we've built this scientific understanding, at every stage we're relying more and more on objective data, on mathematical models, on our machines, on our technology. You know, the telescopes that astronomers use now, no one actually looks through those. You know, the light is hit, you know, reaches electronic detectors and is processed by computers. So it's this very objective, mathematical, evidence-based approach to understanding what's out there, which I, I think is brilliant and important and fascinating and gives us so many, you know, inspiring ideas and, 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 and views of the universe. But I couldn't help feel a bit sad about how at the same time we've kind of sidelined our own experience and, and connection and, and beliefs about those, about the sky. We don't see that as really telling us anything important anymore um, and I, I hope that what the book will help to do but also dark skies reserves and, and the fight for dark skies what that will do is help to kind of retrieve that human aspect of our connection with the stars so the the inspiration the wisdom the the meaning the, the personal connection I think that's something that we have lost and something that we really need to try and rescue and I think just to sort of close up, for me, the, the thing that I loved about your book was there was a particular line when you said star myths are our cultural memories. And I just thought that was really powerful because I think in one sentence I got a sense of really what you were looking to do with the book. Um, so I, th I think just to close, a huge thank you, Joe, for, for spending some time with us this evening. And I'm going to get the book back on screen. <laughs> Here we go. So The Human Cosmos is available from Canongate Gate Books, but also I'd hugely urge people to support any of their local independent bookshops as well. And the Dark Skies Festival, there's a programme on the South Downs National Park website for um, the rest of our programming um, as, we, as we look to reconnect with the stars on our doorstep. So thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for joining us. And thank, thank you for joining as well. <laughs> Take care. Lovely to meet you. Bye.